Section seven from Richard of Jamestown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Richard of Jamestown: A Story of the Virginia Colony by James Otis. Section seven. A touch of homesickness. There is no need for me to say that it makes both Nathaniel and me glad to be praised by our master, because we keep the house cleanly, and strive to serve the food in such a manner as not to offend the eye. But we would willingly dispense with such welcome words, if thereby it would be possible to see a woman messing around the place. Strive as boys may, they cannot attend to household matters as do girls or women, who have been brought into the world knowing how to perform such tasks and it is more home-like to see them around. Nathaniel and I often picture to each other what this village of Jamestown would be if in each camp, cave, or log hut, a woman was in command, and ever when we talk thus comes into my heart a sickness for the old homes of England, even though after my mother died there was none for me. But yet it would do me a world of good even to look upon a housewife, a most friendly gentleman is Master Hunt, and even though he is far above me in station, I never fail of getting a kindly greeting when I am so fortunate as to meet him. He comes often to see Captain Smith, for the two talk long and earnestly over the matter of the council, and at such times it is as if he went out of his way to give me a good word. Master Hunt's Preaching Therefore it is that I go to hear him preach whenever the people are summoned to a meeting beneath the square of canvas in the wood, and more than once I have heard from him that which has taken the sickness for home out of my heart. Our people are not inclined to listen to him in great numbers, however. I have never seen above twenty at one time, the others being busy in the search for gold, or trying to decide among themselves as to how it may best be found. More than once I have heard Master Hunt say, while talking privately with my master, that there would be a greater hope for this village of ours if we had more laborers and less gentlemen, for in a new land it is only work that can win in a battle against the savages in the wilderness. Four carpenters, one blacksmith, two bricklayers, a mason, a tailor, a barber, a sailor, and a drummer make up the list of skilled workmen, if indeed one who can do nothing save drum may be called a laborer. To these may be added twelve serving men and four boys. All the others are gentlemen, or, as Master Hunt puts it, drones expecting to live through the mercy of God whom they turn their backs upon. Neglecting to provide for the future. The one thing which seemed most surprising to us lads, after Captain Smith had called it to our notice, was that these people, who knew there could be no question but that the winter would find them in Jamestown, when there could be neither roasting ears, peas, beans, nor fowls of the air to be come at, made no provision for a harvest. Captain Smith, not being allowed to raise his voice in the council, could only speak as one whose words have little weight, since he was not in authority but he lost no opportunity of telling these gold-seekers that only those who sowed might reap, and unless seed was put into the ground, there would be no crops to serve as food during the winter. Even Master Wingfield, the president of the council, refused to listen when my master would have spoken to him as a friend. He gave more heed to exploring the land than to what might be our fate in the future. He would not even allow the gentleman to make such a fort as might withstand an assault by the savages, seeming to think it of more importance to know what was to be found on the banks of this river or of that, than to guard against those brown people who daily gave token of being unfriendly. The serving men and laborers were employed in making clapboards, that we might have a cargo with which to fill one of Captain Newport's ship when he returned from England according to the plans of the London Company. The gentlemen roamed here or there, seeking the yellow metal, which had much the same as caused a madness among them, and save in the case of Master Hunt and Captain Smith, none planted even the smallest garden. Surprised by Savages 
the fort, as it was called, had been built only of the branches of trees, and might easily have been overrun by savages bent on doing us harm. It was while Master Wingfield, with thirty of the gentlemen, was gone to visit Powhatan's village, and the others were hunting for gold, leaving only my master and the preacher to look after the serving men and the laborers, that upward of a hundred naked savages suddenly came down upon us, counting to make an end of all who were in the town. It was a most fearsome sight to see the brown men, their bodies painted with many colors, carrying bows and arrows, dash out from among the trees bent on taking our lives, and for what seemed a very long while our people ran here and there like ants whose nest had been broken in upon. Captain Smith gave no heed for his own safety, but shouted for all to take refuge in our house of logs, while Master Hunt did what he might to aid in the defense. Yet, because there had been no exercise at arms, nor training, that each should know what was his part at such a time, seventeen of the people were wounded, some grievously, and one boy, James Brumfield, of whom I have already spoken, was killed by an arrow piercing his eye. STRENGTHENING THE FORT Next day, when Master Wingfield and his following came in, none the better for having gone to Powhatan's village, all understood that it would have been wiser had they listened to my master when he counseled them to take exercise at arms, and straightway all the men were set about making a fort with a palisade which last is the name for a fence built of logs set on end, side by side, in the ground, and rising so high that the enemy may not climb over it. This work took all the time of the laborers until the summer was gone, and in the meanwhile the gentlemen made use of the stores left of us by the fleet, until there remained no more than one half pint of wheat to each man for a day's food. The savages strove by day and by night to murder us, till it was no longer safe to go in search of oysters or wild fowl, and from wheat which had lain so long in the holds of the ships that nearly every grain in it had a worm, did we get our only nourishment. The labor of building the palisade was most grievous, and it was not within the power of man to continue it while eating such food. Therefore the sickness came upon us when it was as if all had been condemned to die. A TIME OF SICKNESS AND DEATH The first who went out from among us was John Asby, on the 6th of August. Three days later George Flowers followed him. On the 10th of the same month William Bruster, one of the gentlemen, died of a wound given by the savages while he was searching for gold, and two others laid down their lives within the next eight and forty hours. Then the deaths came rapidly, gentlemen as well as serving men or laborers, until near eighty of our company were either in the grave, or unable to move out of such shelters as served as houses. A great fear came upon all, save that my master held his head as high as ever, and went here and there with Master Hunt to do what he might toward soothing the sick and comforting the dying. It was on the twentieth day of August when Captain Bartholomew Gosnold, one of the council, died, and then Master Wingfield forgot all else save his own safety. More than one in our village declared that he was making ready the pinnace that he might run away from us, as if the angel of death could be escaped from by flight. It was starvation brought about sheer neglect, together with lying upon the bare ground and drinking of the river water which by this time was very muddy, that had brought us to such a pass. Save for the king, Powhatan, and some few of the other savages in authority, we must all have died. But when there were only five in our company, able to stand without aid, God touched the hearts of these Indians. They, who had lately been trying to kill us, suddenly came to do what they might toward saving our lives, after a full half of the company were in the grave. They brought food such as was needed to nourish us, and within a short time the greater number of us who were left alive could go about, but only with difficulty. It was a time of terror, of suffering, and of close acquaintance with death, such as I cannot set down in words, 
for even at this late day the thought of what we then endured chills my heart when we had been restored to health and strength and were no longer hungry thanks to those who had been our bitter enemies the chief men of the village began to realize that my master had not only given good advice on all occasions but stood among them bravely when the president of the council was making preparations to run away end of section seven